couple of questions about Ethereum. Um, yeah, it looks like a, um, an interesting um, experiment that you guys are running that side. Uh, it also looks like one of the things that um, you know, hopefully the guys are a little bit more committed to to actually like see get off the ground. Um, and it does seem as though they. There's a couple of like advances that you guys um, want to build into the thing. Um, would you mind introducing yourself a bit? I mean, just basically talk a bit about like your history, where you first found like the Bitcoin community, um, you know, and um, basically just a little bit about how you ended up where you are now. Okay, so I first uh, joined the Bitcoin community back in March 2011. I heard about it on the on the internet, and I decided this is something interesting that I should uh, try and get into. So the first thing I did is I uh, jumped onto the Bitcoin Talk forums and I tried to find some way I could actually earn some of these Bitcoins. So there was a guy, a guy who was named Kiba on the forums. He was trying to set up a, a blog called Bitcoin Weekly, where he was basically paying people five Bitcoins to write an article. And five I think Bitcoins I remember then, that, actually. Yeah. And five Bitcoins back then was $3.75. So I yeah, wrote, a few, wrote a few articles, earned about 20 Bitcoins, then a few months later, Bihai Alicia, who's the founder of Bitcoin Magazine, brought me in as the first writer. So we started, I wrote for Bitcoin Magazine for about two years. Then during that, I, uh, I went to university. But then, but then in April 2013, I, uh, after eight months of university, I quit because I realized that I wanted to go into Bitcoin full time. So I basically traveled around the world into the, all the various Bitcoin communities and working on different Bitcoin projects. And then I came up with uh, after like uh, read after looking through a whole bu a whole bunch of these sort of different cryptocurrency 2.0 protocols, which I got really interested in at some point in October, basically at the end of at the end of November, I finally uh, came up with the idea for Ethereum. Okay, uh, tell tell me a little bit about like your travels and so forth. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. there's some very interesting characters in this community. You know, uh, real space cadets, some of them. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Okay, yeah. So I would say the most interesting part. So I well, I went to several different parts. Uh, first part was uh, New Hampshire. There is a pretty large Bitcoin community there. Uh, there is uh, an event called Pork Fest. It's really more uh, like at the core, it's more a political event, but where there is a bunch of uh, people all come, all come together for for about a week, and it's sort of this this campground far far off in the middle of a forest. But really, there's like the people there really like Bitcoin, and so like there's a bunch of different merchants where you can like buy food from. And in the past two years, more than half of them have ex have been accepting Bitcoin. So it was really more of a Bitcoin event than anything else on some level. Okay. Then uh, other interesting place was uh, Spain. So Spain is uh, interesting because there there is this uh, place in Spain called Colofo. It's this. They call themselves a uh, post-capitalist eco, eco industrial colony. It's this sort of abandoned factory. So the way that the, that the whole place started is that there is a guy. His name is Enrique Turan, who basically borrowed about 500,000 euros from a, a bunch of different banks back in 2008, and then he, he just defaulted on all the loans, and he and he invested the 500 the 500k into these various different community projects in Catalonia. So this is one of them. So there is about 30 people living in this abandoned factory full time. You know, they're pr producing a lot of stuff for, the, uh, for themselves. There is uh, some people working on various different industrial projects. And there's about 10 Bitcoin developers there. So it's this really interesting sort of somewhat futuristic, somewhat retro sort of uh, place. Um, so one of the m m more famous Bitcoin developers there, his name is Amir Taki. He's mm -hmm. a pretty famous famous guy in the Bitcoin scene, especially for some of his somewhat radical presentations in front of mainstream media. Yeah. 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 So aside from that, look, there's a lot of big, interesting Bitcoin places in all around Europe. Um, and then the other place that's somewhat interesting is actually Israel. So in Israel, the, there's a, actually a big Bitcoin community in Tel Aviv. Like Tel Aviv is a really remarkable place. I think a lot of people underappreciate it. So this is a city with 400,000 people, and over a thousand of them are in the meetup group. And there are three Bitcoin restaurants accepting Bitcoin. So that's, yeah, quarter percent of the city is actually are actually active Bitcoiners at the very least.
Yeah. Um, I mean, regardless of what you think of, like, um, I think the, you know, the, the whole Israel situation, I mean, it's pretty admirable that, I mean, in every direction that they have land neighbors, I mean, they don't get along with any of them, and they still seem to be doing okay, relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I think the Israeli people seem to be very entrepreneurial, like, there's a huge focus there on, uh, on startups and people having their own projects and so forth. Um, mm. Um, okay, well tell me, who, who would you say is the most interesting person so far you've met in the Bitcoin community? If, if you don't want to say, I suppose that's okay as well, you can talk in vague terms. No, it's hard to find a single person, like, there's interesting, that's the thing that I like about Bitcoin is it attracts all of these different, really different interesting people from so many different walks of life, life throughout. Like over at Porkfest, I met David Friedman. He is the son of Milton Friedman, who is obviously the famous economist. And he actually just bought his first twenty dollars worth of Bitcoin there, so I saw him do it. Um, over in Spain, you know, Amir Taki. Then there's yeah, that's more. In uh, in Switzerland, I met uh, Carl Lundstrom. He is the he is like the main financier of the Pirate Bay, so he's get tr trying to get into Bitcoin stuff. Then there's uh, in is in Israel. There's no there's no one particularly fam famous person, but there's quite a lot of major major people. And they're like Manny Rosenfeld is probably the most major uh, Bitcoin mathematician. Like Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv and Haifa seem to be like the hotbeds of cryptographers that are really interested in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Like Adi Shamir, he is the, one of the inventors of RSA, the world famous encryption algorithm that lots lots of people use. Really, we all use every day. And he's starting to get into Bitcoin somewhat. So it's uh, yeah. Every he actually was that the first work on de-anonymization. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, we're, we're glad he did it, and we're sad he did it. So we'll see how how we can fix that in the future. Yeah. Speaking, well, speaking of mm -hmm. well, speaking of de-anonymization, actually, there is a group in Haifa that are working on this technology in, called SCAMP, which is secure, secure Computational Integrity and Privacy. And this technology is actually being, is actually one of the front, run, front runners in terms of Bitcoin anonymization. So the idea here is that there's a lot of these sort of new anonymizing protocols that try and use these really advanced uh, cryptographic protocols to try and figure out how to make a Bitcoin without the public transaction log. So, pretty okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I guess I'd, I'd love to hear more about that as well. D tell me something. While while we're on the whole thing of um, of improving on anonymity, um, I see that you are one of the uh, signing um, accounts for the Dark Wallet project as well. Um, how yeah. is that coming along? Are you still involved, or what's happening at the moment? I uh, yeah. Unfortunately, less involved than I th than I thought I would be, simply because all these other ideas like Ethereum and CryptoKit came along. Which I'm more involved with now, but we are, uh, we are, we are all working working together on some level. I'm hoping to still continue working with Dark Wallet, especially. So I think they're a good team that's really committed to improving Bitcoin privacy. So there is a lot of potential for good things uh, to come out of working with them. Okay. Do they have like some sort of a release date target yet? I don't think so. All right, all right. Okay, but luckily we can keep you partially responsible for that multi-sig wallet, so. Yep. All right, um, tell me something. Let's move on to Ethereum a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so can you, like, in a nutshell, basically, um, I mean, there's, okay, I'm, I'm assuming that whoever watches this video afterwards has at least, you know, heard of Bitcoin and, um, you know, will talk a little bit about the concept of a, of a distributed autonomous organization, but um, what, exactly, uh, what exactly is Ethereum, if you had to explain it to someone? Okay, it's basically, like, it's not like Bitcoin, but with the scripting uh, language uh, built uh, in, uh, is the, simple, the simplest uh, explanation. So the idea is that the whole con idea of Ethereum relies on this concept called contracts. And contracts are basically these sort of autonomous agents that have, that have code that are simulated inside of the Ethereum network. And then you can, set, you can send uh, transactions to these autonomous agents, and these autonomous agents can themselves send transactions and different these different mm -hmm. contracts can have relationships with each other and so forth. Yeah. So the idea is, is 
for these contracts, you can encode the you can encode the rules behind any kind of contracts or any kind of organization that you can mathematically define. So if you so if you can if you have an idea for a financial contract or a decentralized application or a sorry, yeah. uh, Vitalik, I have to ask you for one second. Yeah, I plugged in my net, my laptop, and everything nicely, and I forgot to turn on the actual power. Give me one moment. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Okay, right. So, so this is our this is in right. So the idea with the Ethereum is that if is that basically if you if you have some kind of if you have an idea for a financial contract or a decentralized application or a decentralized organization, then as long as long as you can mathematically specify what the rules of that of that contract or that organization are, you can pretty much implement it on the Ethereum network. So there basically are no limits to what you can do with it. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the. Um, there is some basic scripting in Bitcoin as well. Right. Um, what would you say the limitations of that okay. scripting are that right. you feel so, that couldn't be addressed, uh, that had to right. be addressed through so, something like Ethereum? So Bitcoin scripts have two major limitations. One limitation is this idea of Turing completeness. So Bitcoin scripts are not Turing complete. Which means, so specifically, there's no concept of a loop in Bitcoin scripting language. So what that means is, is that there's, they are extremely restricted. They can't have computation. They can't have computations that like loop through, that do a loop through some data and, and have have like arbitrary complexity. So there's, so you can have scripts, you can have scripts, but all the scripts have to be guaranteed to run to run to completion in some, in some very short length of time. Um, so th that's one limitation. Then the other limitation is the idea that a Bitcoin contract uh, don't have any state. So a Bitcoin transaction can either be spent or it can be unspent. So like that's potentially it's it's viable for something simple like multisig, but when you try to encode some some kind of more complicated application like some. A sort of de a decentralized Dropbox contract or a distributed autonomous organization or anything like that. It, it really stop. It's really not adequate enough because something like an organization is going to have a lot more state than just an on/off switch. So with Ethereum, your contracts can have pretty much an almost unlimited di number, different number of states through the, con through the contract storage mechanism. Okay, so um, to recap, basically, you say that the two major advances that you're going to put into Ethereum on the scripting side is specifically number one that um, your things are Turing complete, uh, yeah. which in essence, I mean, for for the layman, just means we can build loops, right? Yeah, and loops are layman, critical for. Yeah, for the layman, Turing completeness means that there are no restrictions. Anything that you can compute, you can compute in any Turing complete language. Yes. All right, and then the second one basically is that um, the states after a script has computed in um, Bitcoin is either going to be spent or unspent or some combination of that basically. Yeah. And okay. So and in Ethereum, and in Ethereum, contracts can have balances, and they also have this large body of array of memory where you can basically put whatever whatever data you want into a, into a contract, and you can change it as well. Okay, so in other words, let's say over time, um, let's say arguments like I am uh, contracted to write a piece of software, like hypothetical, then as I hand in things, you know, somebody else can come along and actually sign off milestones on the original contract and that will state how far I am through the project, something to that effect. Yeah, uh, you could, like here's another example, there's a recurring billing. So, for example, one of the biggest problems in Bitcoin is that you is that it's hard to do recurring billing. So, if you want to say pay uh, twenty dollars a month for some website subscription, then in Bitcoin you can't really do that. You can't really set up a, a transaction where you can remove a maximum of twenty dollars a month. You you every transaction has to be either not spent at all or spent completely. Whereas in Ethereum you can do that. You can set up a contract and then you can. In, su in such a way that you can authorize for, say, Netflix to take out a maximum of $20 a month. Okay, so in other words, then um, I would, I'm would i assuming that I would obviously still have to sign that contract as the holder yeah. of that account yes. for that thing to become valid, but then the Ethereum 
um, you know, the, okay, we'll, we'll get to the details of how actually Ethereum sort of like runs, but um, then basically what will happen is Ethereum will um, execute that contract on my behalf, but I have to still sign it. Yes. Yes. You, st you basically have to put your money into the, into the contract first, and then the contract can do with its money whatever it was programmed to do. Okay, so it's so it's like a contract specific thing. So if I put some amount of money into the contract, then that yeah. basically gets deducted over time. Yeah. All right. Um, what, well, okay. I mean, just on the Netflix example, what for instance, if I only have eight dollars worth of of whatever currency this thing is denominated in, you know, um, at the moment, but then by next month, hopefully, I'll get a paycheck and then I'll actually like be able yeah. to top up again. Right. How yes. would that contract work? Yeah. Well, the thing. Well, Ethereum can't really can't enforce any kind of debt, so it's not going to let you buy a service before you pay for it. But we, but you okay. definitely can have a contract that keeps on paying twenty dollars a month, and then you just refill it. You could okay. even have a, so you could even have a contract where you where there's one contract that you refill, and and you can assign multiple entities permission to withdraw some amount per month. Okay. Okay, that sounds interesting. Uh, tell me something, right? On the um, all right, just on like the the economic side of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, for uh, yeah, I mean, again, it could, it could be like a whole three-hour interview on its own. But what what like economic need do you see something like Ethereum actually fulfilling? And specifically, like um, I mean, if I understand it correctly, Ethereum is like the base on top of which we can build distributed autonomous organizations. Can you yes. talk a little bit about that and what the economic need and the economic benefits are there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right, I, look, the idea behind peer-to-peer -peer protocols isn't a new one. We've had peer-to-peer -peer protocols for about 12 years now. We've had BitTorrent, we've had BitMessage, and now we, we've had like all these other di different torrent protocols and so forth, right? But the thing that they were all missing up until now is some, is some kind of economic layer. So one of the big problems with BitTorrent, for example, is that some, like, Extremely popular files like Linux distributions or popular movies, they're easy to get simply because there's so many people and some of them are going to be seeding anyway. But for anything more obscure, there's just no incentive for anyone to seed. So often it's act it's very hard to find to find something on there. So if you add an economic layer though, you could come com come up with some kind of protocol so there's actually an economic incentive for, for people to act as seeders. That's just one example. So also, if you want to have some kind of decentralized file storage, you need to have incentive for people to rent, for people to hand out their own hard drive space. So what I see, and then on the other side, though, you have Bitcoin, which is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol for money, but it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol for just money. So what I see Ethereum being is as this sort of bridge between the two worlds. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol for money, but at the same time, it includes all this scripting functionality that lets that sort of acts as a bridge between the, these sort of peer-to-peer mon -peer monetary and peer-to-peer non-monetary worlds. Okay, well that that's an interesting take on it, basically. Um, so in other words, um, what you're saying is that um, you're not really pitching Ethereum as a um, you know necessarily as an altcoin. I know that's on your site as well. It's yeah. specifically a contract enforcement um, yeah. uh, environment, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, a, a full, or even a fulfillment environment. Say again, a eh? contract fulfillment, fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah, not not yeah. enforcement, obviously. Yeah, Ethereum yeah. doesn't enforce anything. It's. <laughs> yeah, I, well, we have these little drones that are going to fly around and they're going to like sort <laughs> yeah. the guys out yeah. to default. Yeah. Um, okay, tell me something else, right? Um, all right, so Ethereum technically, right? So um, a couple of like the terms that, uh, you know, uh, just like a couple of the terms on the thing there. Um, I mean, you have things there like a block tree. Um, uh, what is a block tree? How does, how does Ethereum, how is Ethereum basically going to be implemented if you had to like um, e explain it to us like we were 15 and not mathematically inclined? Okay, so the basic idea is, is that Ethereum is is that there, first of all, the way Bitcoin works is, uh, I think a lot of people understand at this point, there is this concept of a blockchain where you have one block coming out every 10 minutes. Uh, sorry, um, Vitalik, can I interrupt you a second? Sorry, man, I'm, I'm hearing, um, I'm, I'm fairly sure I can actually make out the other conversation that might be going on. Um, is it at all possible, um, I don't know if there's... Uh, you know, I, I know you guys are actually working at the moment. I know you guys are actually working at the moment, so I don't want to like interfere with that. Yeah, but um, I think we'll be better for now. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, so you were saying. Right, so so in Bitcoin, there is this concept of uh, a blockchain where you have one block coming out every 10 minutes, and each block contains a list of transactions, and these, and that list of transactions basically updates what the, what the balance sheet is. So the concept of a balance sheet, you can think of that as basically Alice has like 50 Bitcoins, Bob has 20 Bitcoins, and so forth, and transactions update that. So Ethereum has a very similar model, except in Ethereum there's two, there's actually two tree, two trees inside of a single block. So in Bitcoin there's just one tree. There's a transaction tree which contains all the transactions, whereas in Ethereum we have two trees. You have the the transaction, you have the transactions, and you also have the balance sheet. So the balance, so the idea there is that inside of every block you actually have a the you. The, enti- the balance of every of every single Ethereum contract and the entire state of every single Ethereum contract. So that for, now that sounds like it might be extremely wasteful, like you might have several gigabytes in every block. But we have but we use this concept called a functional data structures, which basically do a do deduplication. So because two blocks are going to be almost exactly the same as each other, what happens is is that we actually only store the data that's the same once. And then we just store two, and we just store two pointers to it. So, so it's actually really not not, not that much more ineff- inefficient than Bitcoin is. But what, on the other hand, what you gain is that you do gain some some scalability benefits. So the scalability benefits basically are that you can have you can have what's called a light client, where a light client doesn't actually download the full blockchain. It just looks at a very it just cares about what its own balance is, and you can have light clients that are completely se- that are completely secure with a very small memory footprint. So Bitcoin, okay, so that, yeah. Okay, so just on that point, basically, so you're saying that um, let's say, for instance, um, you know, we're currently, um, you know, I might have a wallet on my phone. Uh, what would happen though with Ethereum is I could have some sort of like an agent running on my phone, but the only part of the blockchain it would ever care about are the contracts relevant to it. Yeah, exactly. So the thing with wallets on your phone, phone now, a lot of them, is that they do st- they do still rely on some kind of central parties. Like they might rely on blockchain.info, and they might rely on some on some servers. Whereas, whereas with Ethereum, you can have a light client that just pretty much that connects to the network and just the network. So mm-hmm. so you could do that in Bitcoin, but Ethereum's des- design actually makes it much more efficient to do that. So uh, I predict. So the idea is, is that like the point, the reason why we have cryptocurrency is because we want to have this sort of decentralized setup where you don't need to trust a small number of serv- of, of centralized servers for everything. And Ethereum will actually make it even easier to bring that level of that level of decentralization out to even very restricted computing environments like smartphones. Okay, let's um, let's talk about the, um, the just a, a few Bitcoin questions that I have for you that um, okay. you know that generally like way on my mind. Um, but the one is basically the um, you know the centralization or at least the incentivization to to host nodes and to mine. Right now, those two things, as far as I can tell, are not actually the same thing. Right? I mean, the one has to do with um, securing uh, a block and the blockchain to make sure that it's computationally incredibly expensive to um, you know to alter the the set of transactions. Right. The second thing has to do with obviously hosting this. Um, you know, this rather large infrastructure is going to eventually become very, very large. Um, you know, and rewarding people for actually trying to do that. Now, um, I mean, we've already seen like a drop in the amount of like uh, nodes that we can actually identify. Um, so, um, so just on that point a little bit, is that something that concerns you about Bitcoin? Is that something you think that needs to yeah. be addressed? Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, so there's two different issues there in terms of centralization. So one issue is the centralization of mining. So Bitcoin mining right now relies on specialized hardware. And there is a very serious risk, I think, that in a few years, pretty much all of the mining hardware is going to be built by a few, a few large banks that can just have, con- have contacts with a few, a few specialized organizations that are better at producing specialized hardware than everyone else. So we have a few, a few innovations in the, that we're trying to use to fix that. So we're looking into memory hard groups of work. We're looking at CPU friendly groups of work. We are looking at proof of stake. Uh, we are basically instead of voting with your with your mining hardware, you vote with your with your bitcoins or in this case your ether. So that's one side. And then the other side is this issue of how how many how much 
compute computational time and space to actually need to run a full node. So you are very correct that the number of Bitcoin nodes is is still going down. It's at a few thousand, and so the risk there is that if the number of Bitcoin nodes keeps going down, then we'll have a setup where only a few hundred a few hundred people actually end up running nodes, and those people are going to be visible, and the entire thing is not going to be any more any more secure against uh, regulatory at- attacks or or large corporate influence than the than the existing banking system. So, in terms of fixing that, um, once again, there are there are no easy solutions. There are a lot of partial solutions. So, for example, when I was talking about the two trees and the simplified payment verification, that's one of the partial solutions. So you could ha- you could have a node that's not a full node, but it's still trust free. Then we're also looking at a few other setups where you can have like where you can have like auditing no- special auditing nodes that can that can come up with uh, s- succinct proofs that uh, that other nodes are acting dishonestly in some way. So there's it's not an area where we have good solutions, but it is something we're very actively researching. Yeah. Uh, okay. One of the uh, basically, like one of the, I mean, I mean, this is just off the top of my head, basically. But um, I mean, one of the solutions, at least for like the, uh, you know, the hosting of the, of all that infrastructure, right? Um, let me just get something straight on Ethereum first. Will will the nodes will all the nodes actually have to host like a, a will you get like these two variants where you have full hosting nodes and what's the incentive to have a full hosting node and then you have like separate sort of like partial nodes that only host um, you know basically contracts right. related to them and the incentive is you know the maintenance of their own contracts. Right. That's uh, basically there. You are right. There basically is no incentive to run a full node at this point. That's a problem with Ethereum. That's a problem with Bitcoin. So, mm, it's an area. All I can say at this point is that it's an area of research. Okay, so it's still an area of research. You don't necessarily have um, have any suggestions on it. I, I mean, just a just a basic thing that I thought of was that if you if you add something to the block header, where whatever hash is generated has to also then look up. You know, some uh, provably you know unpredictable uh, transaction off the blockchain with unspent inputs, or at least with unspent out, yeah, with unspent inputs. Then um, you know, then at least that way the guy would also have to prove that he could very quickly access the entire blockchain. You know, and that might actually just shift the balance back a little bit to look up right, versus that's, just purely hashing. Right. That's that's basically called called proof of stake. I think it's it is that that is one of the things we're looking into. Okay, is proof of stake, uh, when you say proof of stake, if I understand it correctly, proof of stake is essentially when you have money in the system, your vote yeah. counts more. Is that, is that right. correct? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, tell me something about the incentivization system of, um, of Ethereum at the moment, right? Um, you guys have an internal, um, like, uh, again, I'm, I'll, I'll try not to call it an altcoin, but it sounds an awful lot like an altcoin. You have an alternative, like, token system on the inside called Ether. Yes. Um, on what basis will yeah. Ether be rewarded to people? How will you get Ether? So it's a combination of different models. So we, ha- <coughs> so you might have heard of uh, Mastercoin and, and Ripple before. So the way Mastercoin did their issuance is they said, "Here's a, we're going to be selling Mastercoins at a rate of 100 Mastercoins for everyone who sends a Bitcoin. And that's how all the Mastercoins got issued. So people sent in about 5,000 uh, Bitcoins, about 500,000 Mastercoins were created. And that's how all the master coins that exist now are created. And then the way Ripple works is that they basically created 100 billion uh, Ripple credits for the organization, and they decide how those are distributed out. So at this point, uh, we're what we're thinking of is we're thinking of an approach that ha- that has us a, a small some element of the master coin approach, a small part of the Ripple approach, but it's mostly Bitcoin like. So the idea there is that there are a, cer- a certain number of coins that are pre-issued and they'll be sold at a price at a price of somewhere from 1,000 to 2,000 ether for a bitcoin. But then later on, there's going to be about uh, 40 percent of the amount that gets initially issued is going to get re- is going to get released every year. And unlike bitcoin, it doesn't go down. So it's it's sort of like linear. So if say 10 million, or if say if 50 if 10 million of these. Uh, 10 million ether gets uh, released at the beginning of the fundraiser. Then there's going to be another, uh, another something like five million will get pre-mined, and then four million will get, will get normally mined every year. 
Okay, so so, but you're saying about half of the currency will be pre-mined then? Um, Not half, no. So we are still looking at that. We might actually end up reducing it. At this point, it's 33% of what exists initially, which is obviously pretty much 0% of the amount that will ever, that will ever exist in the very long term. Okay, the um, and and okay, so ether gets released. Is it a percentage of the total amount that keeps on getting released? Is it a no, set it's amount? A, it's a it's a set amount. Okay, so but over time, the inflation of ether will basically also tend towards zero. Yes, exactly. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So talk a little bit about that. Talk about the funding structure of Ethereum. Um, just some uh, some concerns that I generally have is, I mean, um, I was I was quite up in arms about the SEC who said that uh, you know uh, Kickstarter projects now need something like um, well the, those type of crowdfundings now need something like thirty thousand dollars to raise a hundred thousand dollars. You know, they need to put that down in guarantees. Um, and uh, then basically I had a little bit of an honest look at some of the projects in the Bitcoin community. And I mean, the things on BitStarter, I think there were two projects that were funded. I don't know about the other one, but another one I was excited about was Frog. Frog never got went anywhere to my knowledge. Um, and it seems like there's quite a few of these things. You know, the, the community seems to be very optimistic, you know, and then sometimes we even like throw money at things and you know, just sometimes very little happens. So, um, so talk a little bit about how you guys intend on funding this thing, and um, and why you think it is that projects sometimes don't get seen through, and and why it is that that you know if we give money to Ethereum, that flip it, we're going to see Ethereum happen, even if the experiment fails. At least the experiment will you know will will launch properly. Yeah. So the. Our first major, major uh, legal defense there is that we are not going to be based in the U.S. We are going to be based, we're think, currently thinking of Switzerland, and uh, depending on what legal advice we get, we may or may not we may or may not even decide to block U.S. investors. So that's poten potentially on the t on the table. We uh, it really so the way that we're legally positioning this is sort of as a is sort of as a presale where we're selling. We're selling some some amount of ether for for Bitcoin, and uh, it's it's sort sort of exact exactly like any any other kind of product taking pre-orders. But basically, there are some different different strategies that we can that we can choose, and uh, I'm not I'm not going to actually commit commit to saying any, anything certainly. Uh, simply until we get the le the legal advice saying that this that it's okay for us to proceed in exactly this way. Okay, why why would you say it is that that um, I, I mean at least from my perspective, so many of the projects in the um, Bitcoin community don't necessarily get done, you know, or get 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 off the ground like uh, we hope they would. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that's something that ha that happens. I think you know, pr pretty much everywhere. You know, people get excited about a project and then people stop caring. I think for us, just the fact the fact is, you know, we we got into. Into CoinDesk, we got into Fortune, we got into Wire. Pretty much the entire community is watching. So I don't think we're going to even be able to just just sort of quietly have this disappear. It basically, it's it's out there. If we don't develop it, then someone else will. Like, okay. Rip, yeah. Um. So okay. So you're basically just saying that that the DAC base you feel is enough of an economic opportunity that somebody somewhere will run with the thing. Yeah, I think so. I mean. There's already already been just so much community interest about this whole decentralized autonomous organization concept. I mean, I just can't I just can't imagine the idea just dying out at this point. Okay, um, tell me something else, right? Um, one of the one of the things about Bitcoin that um, I think is still possible is that we can still change things. I mean, if we don't like something, we can you know change maybe a hashing algorithm here. We can change a couple of stuff there. Um, but obviously, over time, that is going to become increasingly difficult, especially that if we actually old. like. Say again? That is already that is already extremely difficult. Like, have you seen mm. just how much politics there is around something as trivial as removing the one megabyte block size limit? I mean, people mm. have been arguing about this for months. Like, the fact is that unless we get some kind of like disaster, something like the NSA coming up with a quantum computer, I don't think any kind of any kind of like hard forking change in the Bitcoin protocol is going to happen. 
Um, okay, but um, so for Ethereum, for instance, how would you um, how would you address changes that that arise? I mean, like for Bitcoin, just the thing that we've already mentioned now could could turn out fatal for Bitcoin. I mean, it could you know eventually yeah. mean that the people abandon the currency. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I think we are going to put a lot more care into figuring out how to set good param good parameters from the start and trying to like actually have economic justification behind the parameters rather than just setting them in stone. So one of the recent things that, for, that we have, for example, is that in Bitcoin, Bitcoin has this built-in scripting language. It has about 80 opcodes, and some of these opcodes are these extremely specialized things like SHA-256, RIPE-MD-160, and so forth, right? So that's how we were also doing our scripting language from the start. We said, OK, let's have some opcodes for this crypto stuff. Here, we're going to have an opcode in the scripting language for SHA-256 and for SHA-3. But then what we realize is that that's not future-proof. So as soon as SHA-4 comes out, there's not going to be an opcode for SHA-4. And, and mm -hmm. it's going to take way too much politics to actually put in an opcode. So right now, what we're actually thinking of is we're going to remove this idea of specialized opcodes entirely. And instead, mm -hmm. we are going to move to this small, uh, to this model where essentially you, you have to, uh, where es essentially there are there are only a few op a few operations, but then if a cer if a certain set of operations gets you, if a certain script gets used a lot, then it can get then we can detect it and we can start optimizing it automatically. So there is a, a so there's a sort of me mechanism for basically folding in future future uh, fu functions and operations like SHA4 and SHA and SHA5 and new different types of cryptography in pretty much seamlessly. Okay, so you're saying that if, if some sequence of um, of opcodes basically recurs a lot, then you can have that like registered as its own opcode almost automatically. Pretty much, yeah. That's oh, okay. that's what we're that's trying to strive cool. towards. Okay, so that's basically how you're trying to make the thing um, future proof. Uh, yeah. You know, is is by keeping it generic as far as possible. Exactly. That's it's one of our principles. I think just simplicity. So make makes the protocol as as generic and as simple as possible and include and try to intelligently include ways that you where certain things uh, can poten can potentially be changed but have them be changed in this very very restricted and this and, and more sort of fluid way rather than having these abrupt hard forking changes okay um all right, hold on a second here for me. All right, um, tell me something, right? Uh, the stuff that you guys are trying to do. Now, obviously, I think we've covered some of it already just in the sheer volume of politics that's necessary to, um, you know, to, to make changes. But, um, but at this point, um, I mean, uh, as far as I understand, one of the reasons that we don't have a Turing complete language in uh, Bitcoin uh, is the fact that, you know, if it were Turing complete, it could, like, consume quite a lot of uh, resources just running into an infinite loop trying to evaluate a contract. Um, why can't we just extend Bitcoin? Uh, is there reasons outside of just the politics of the matter? Well, it's basically the fact that there are a, lo a lot of these uh, uh, different... Yeah, it isn't just the politics. It's also just the fundamental design, in the sense that you can't you can't just put in a a, a system that 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 allows scripts to some to suddenly have uh, all these sort of extra state features and make the scripting language string complete. Because making a scripting language string complete is something that requires a lot of design decisions alongside it. So one of them, for example, is this idea that we have of having a a, a transaction fee for every computational step. That's not something that Bitcoin has. So in order to make Bitcoin have the same functionality as Ethereum, you would basically have to, on some level, pretty much pretty much turn it into Ethereum. So theoretically, anything is possible. Like the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin devs could decide to come out and say, OK, starting from block 350,001, we're going, we're going to switch to this entirely new language and paradigm. But it, it's basically. It, it does. It does ultimately fall down to the fact that the that the politics are basically say that it's way, it's way too hard to make those kind. Of, it's way too hard to convince people to accept that such a radical change. And now I, I do say in their favor, it's not. It's not because the Bitcoin developers are are so bubbling fools that that are that can't uh, work past their differences to work together. It's not that. It's really that Bitcoin blockchain is this train that's like 
that's taking $12 billion, billion worth of value, sort of hurtling over, along at 400 kilometers an hour. So it's you can't really sort of switch the engine around midway. It's extremely risky. If a, if a single thing goes wrong, you know, the price is going to tank by like 30 by like 30 percent or or more. So there's, I think the guys there are, are very rightfully wary about doing about doing anything risky with the, the existing protocol and alternative protocols are exactly the way to, right way to innovate here. Okay. Um, all right. So just on a practical level, though, describe something that uh, that you would like to see somebody build on top of Ethereum. Okay. Um, there is a lot of different applications that I'm ex that I'm actually quite excited about. So one of them is this uh, decentralized Dropbox idea. So the concept there is that you can set up an Ethereum contract where if or if, so say you have a hundred uh, gigabyte f file that or like a hundred gigabyte hard drive that you want to get backed up. So what you would do is you would take the, those 100 gigabytes, you would encrypt it, and then you would push it, publish it to the network. And then you would come up with a contract, and then that contract would automatically, every say every 10 minutes, it would ask for a it would ask for a proof that's that an, that some given node on it would basically ask for some ra some random node node from that file, and the fir and the first uh, node on the network that can provide that block of the file will automatically get rewarded with some say one ether. So the idea there is that there's this contract that just automatically incentivizes everyone on the network to keep backups of your file. And the more generous you the more generous an offer you make with your contract, the the more you're going to get your file backed up. So on on my on the side of people trying to back up their data, it's it's potentially huge. You have this uh, massive massively backed up uh, decentralized file storage system that's pretty much never going to dis never going to disappear. And uh, on the other side, you can now earn money by renting out your own hard drive. That's uh, that's just one application right there. Okay, so so what um, so technically how that would work then is there would be an Ethereum node that actually runs these contracts, right? Yeah. So that node would then essentially like okay, it would come across your contract. Um, it would say okay, well run you know execute this set of stuff. I'm assuming there's some protocol then for that node. To actually talk to an external API of some sort and then get a response right. to that. So this is the other interesting thing about Ethereum is that one thing we want to, to turn the Ethereum client into is this idea of an Android of peer-to-peer -peer protocols. So we want to come up with some common protocols where people can very easily write their own peer-to-peer -peer applications, and those can be peer-to-peer -peer applications that use Ethereum, peer-to-peer -peer applications that don't use Ethereum, and anything in between. So the idea there was that there would be this sort of separate protocol. Which is like the decentralized Dropbox protocol, and then no, no, only you, only users that are interested in participating in that in that particular protocol can can join that can join the network on that channel, and then all of those nodes can can talk to each other and they and they can arrange it. So, yeah. Okay, so um, so basically, you want to, in addition to Ethereum, basically develop a set of uh, protocols as well, where um, you know things like this uh, distributed drop Dropbox could then then be facilitated. Exactly. Okay, um, is is uh, you know is there a blueprint for that on your white paper as well? Is um, there a separate document for it's that? It's not. There aren't any documents on it yet. But like the general vision that we're thinking of is that we're thinking of having our uh, main client or Ethereum of client have be a sort of three layer architecture. So the bottom layer is the actual technical side that interfaces with the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, the second mm -hmm. layer would uh, would be some something would would be the actual graphical user interface. And what the user interface would be is that it would basically be a stripped down web browser. So a stripped down version of uh, like a, a Chromium's V8 V8 engine without a lot of the features that actually make it specialized for browsing websites. And then on top of that, you can write whatever apps you want in JavaScript. So you can write a wallet, you can write a, a financial contracts exchange, you can write this decentralized Dropbox app, and then there, there would be special APIs for sending and receiving stuff to peers on certain channels. So, Okay, so, it's, so, so it'll essentially be like the core It'll be on top of that. There will be some JavaScript-based thing that most people will be able to like teach themselves and program something that'll compile to Ethereum, and then in yeah, addition well, to that, there'll be yeah. Well, it's not. Well, the JavaScript won't compile to Ethereum. So the idea there is that if you think about it, it's like think about an app store, right? So on top, so there, 
on the bottom level, there's Android. Android is sort of like an interface between the computer hardware and the, and the applications on top. And then you have applications on top of Android, and then there's a language and a software development kit that you can use to write applications. So that's sort of what we're going for. So the Ethereum client will be like the Android, and then people can write their own, their own apps in JavaScript. So the JavaScript, so the JavaScript will basically be interpreted inside of this web browser, and you could, and you can write a wall, you can write something like a wallet or any any of these other, of these other applications, and then our system would expose an API to the actual actual Ethereum uh, a blockchain that you could just use to have your application automatically do stuff inside of Ethereum. Okay. Um, all right, so I, I think last Ethereum related question. By the way, um, I think Tristan also knows you. He gave me a couple of questions that I, like personal <laughs> questions that I can ask you just for amusement. But, um, sure. okay, last Ethereum question. Um, tell me who else is on the team, right? Just talk about the other guys on the team a little bit and what are your okay. role distributions and so forth. Okay, so the other three, um, the three lead fiduciary members at this point is there's uh, Charles Hoskinson. He is a mathematician and cryptographer. He used to be both from from Colorado. He also runs the Bitcoin Education Project, which is and he released a whole a whole bunch of educational videos and even an online course on Bitcoin. And secondly, is Anthony Diorio. He also runs a crypto set in the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada and this uh, co-working space in Toronto called Bitcoin Decentral. And the third is uh, Mihai Alicia. He is the uh, founder of Bitcoin Magazine. Then, aside from that, I should I should also mention our uh, development team. So we have Gavin Wood. He is our uh, lead C++ developer. He is the guy that made the C++ client, and which is pretty much the cli the client that's probably the furthest ahead now. Like there's already a proof of concept out. It's a it's a work not perfect, but a wor a working node that you can people can actually use to connect to each other and even send the most basic Ethereum transactions. Then there's also a Jeffrey Wilk, our lead Go, de our lead Go developer. And uh, aside from that, if you will, we have about 15 to 100 people working like part-time or, or full-time. Okay, wow, that actually sounds like a considerably bigger organization than I than I had envisioned. Um, what type of like, uh, what are your total funding numbers? Well, you don't have to, it's like a ballpark figure. Like, do you guys? Right, so we really don't know at this point. Like, I could see us getting anywhere anywhere from 1 million to 30 million. It's hard to say. It's okay. so, no, well, like, even ultimately, 1 million will go quite far if you're motivated yeah, enough. Like, no, like, five, like, even half a million is really enough for us to. Uh, to make the Ethereum system, it's enough, and, and make build the clients up to completion. If we if we get more than one million, like a lot of the excess will go will go towards uh, building applications that improve the value of the Ethereum ecosystem. So we're going to help actually build some of these extra apps, like the decentralized Dropbox app, this uh, financial exchange app, which would be sort of like a decentralized Bitcoinica, um, something like. Um, so name name coin, bit bit message, pretty much anything that you can even potentially make on top of Ethereum, we will make. And then another large third plank of our intended of our plan is actually to uh, help build to help work on some of these uh, cryptographic problems that really affect the crypto cryptocurrency ecosystem as a whole. So one of them is the site question of how what is a good proof of work or proof of stake algorithm? Is it even possible to make a proof of work algorithm that's resistant to specialized hardware? Um, what kind of proof of stake algorithms are the best? Is there some some other alternative? Uh, also the blockchain scalability issue, blockchain blockchain compression. Can you set up a system where that can potentially is like the big question in scalability is is there potentially some way to create a cryptocurrency such that that can run without any full nodes at all. So that breaks breaks through the current major limitation, which is that every node has to process every transaction. Is it possible to create a cryptocurrency where every node might only need to process, say, two percent of all of the transactions? And there, it might be. Um, I, I think the big answer there is just basically on the incentives. 
Um, because I think if there's an incentive to solve that problem, if there's an incentive to actually yeah. split up the blockchain, then generally speaking, you know, people are going to find that, uh, going to find a way to do it. Um, lots of this. Sorry, man, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of background noise, eh? All right, sorry. Um, we're almost done, so uh, they, don't, they don't have to stay too quiet for too much longer. Um, but I think one of the problems is that uh, there are no incentives for these things. You know, um, there's no real incentive at the moment in Bitcoin to really split this thing up. There's no real incentive for a programmer to come up with a way to, you know, basically find his way around this. Um, but just back onto the funding thing. Um, so basically what you'll do with your stretch goals essentially will be that um, you will build many of these distributed autonomous organizations. And I'm assuming you'll be doing a lot of tooling as well. So graphical user interfaces for actually like um, setting up yeah. contracts, programming those kinds of things, debuggers for uh, Ethereum, yeah. that kind of stuff. Pretty, yeah, pretty much all the infrastructure that the ecosystem could use, we can develop. Okay, cool. And then obviously, like additional, um, you know, I mean, if, even if you guys fail, at least the, the community remains anti-fragile, and you guys learned a lot in the process. Like, for instance, a proof of stake that, or at least a proof of work that um, might be specialization resistant. Um, okay, listen. Um, all right, yeah, just a couple of like uh, personal questions, just so that uh, people sure, get yeah. to know you a little bit better. All right, so um, well, th this is my personal question, but do you like have a personal like political ideology or a or a philosophy or anything to that effect? I mean, some of the guys are very radical, like uh, Cody with his 3D gun and his uh, extremely uh, complex reading list, and Amir with his anarchism. Do you have any sort of like, a, or do you just find the science fascinating? I mean, I I do I do like a lot a lot of the, the a lot of the radical uh, political ideas that people like. Both on on Cody's side and the and and on Amir's side of are focusing on, but at the at the same time, I'm also inter interested in finding out what the what the limitations in those ideals are. And I think really part of my attraction of these projects is even actually focusing focusing on what what some of the limitations in these ideals are and seeing how we can use cryptography and technology to potentially overcome them. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that you make a good point there. I mean, lots of the things might actually only become viable once we can replace the structure. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, um, another question. This was Tristan's suggestion. If heaven is real, uh, what would you like to ask God if you meet him one day? Mm, Satoshi's uh, private key. <laughs> but you, I, it might be beyond your use at that time. Are there any other questions? Um, I really don't know. It's. Uh, Like I've, I've always, I've always found that I've gained the most value from, from, from finding answers that I didn't even realize that I needed, didn't even realize that I wanted. And then what? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, yeah, I'm saying that I've, I've actually know, I've, I've noticed that I find that I've gained the most value in life from finding answers to questions that I didn't even realize that I wanted to ask. So, so you'd basically ask God, tell me what question I would really appreciate knowing the answer to. Sure. Okay. Exactly. All right. Um, next one. Uh, so, what is your favorite word and what is your least favorite word? My favorite word is the. I seem to use it every sentence. <laughs> okay. And your least favorite word. Um, I I don't know. I mean, all words have their value at some point. <laughs> so you discriminate against no words. Okay, got that. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, no words also has its point. Okay, so last question, basically, right? Um, okay, so if computers didn't didn't exist, right? Or well, rather, if, if you went into computer science, what would you be doing with your time? Could you do any other work except what you're doing at the moment? Sorry, man, the, the background was insane. For what, yeah. way. Sorry, man, it's insane at that side. I can't hear anything. So anything except for working on decentralized protocols? Um, I don't know. There's lots of interesting math problems problems to work on at this point, I would say. It's, 
Okay, so and okay, but yeah. assuming computers didn't exist, right? Uh, what what would you be doing? Okay, with assuming. Um, good point. Hmm. Maybe something reading probably. I. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you'd read up on other interesting things, and then I and I and then I'd see what I could if there was anything I, I'd be interested in. I mean, that's basically how it works so right now. <laughs> uh, okay, so you'd you'd pretty much even. So you're actually in the process of finding out that if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? Um, yeah, exactly. You, you can send your pretty much. Code you okay. Can well, cool. Thanks a lot, right? uh, Vitlik. We really appreciate the uh, the time that you guys took, you know, that you specifically uh, took so to talk to us. Um, hopefully, yeah, others can find some value from this interview as well. If I can figure out how to actually post the thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks a lot for your time, man. That was quite interesting. I really wish you guys all the best. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm sure you guys are going to keep us posted. Yeah, well, and thanks for talking to me. Okay, have a nice yeah. day further, man. You too.